uh, we, we have, I guess, maybe a little bit more of a more formal presentation today, but uh, folks are absolutely welcome to chime in with your questions. Um, Jess Landon and I will be sure to monitor the chat um, and the Q&A, uh, and we'll interrupt if we need to with, with questions. Um, but uh, maybe also we can just uh, start uh, quickly with um, quick introductions with who's joining us. I think most of our, our uh, attendees probably know Jess, uh, Landon, and myself as the co-hosts of Business as Usual. But um, uh, Sarah, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about who you are? Sure. Good morning, and thanks for having us here today. My name is Sarah Novak. I'm a senior attorney at the State Court Administrator's Office. I focus a lot on electronic access, document security, electronic filing and service. Um, and my co-host and I have been working on this for a few years, so we're very excited to, to be able to be here and share it with you. This has got an interesting history. I'm eager to learn a little <laughs> bit more about, you know, What's with Tyler Hose? <laughs> uh, Anne's already shaking her head. So Anne, you get to speak next. Next, Tell us a little bit about who you are. Good morning. My name is Anne Peterson and I am a senior project manager with the uh, State Court Administration. I've actually worked for the branch for 27 years. I started life as a uh, senior court clerk in Ramsey County. So if there's any of you oldsters on here, this is Bellany Anne. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome, man. Thanks. And, and Jody? And I'm Jody Boyd. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. So I mainly deal with our external communications and making sure that we are able to uh, help our stakeholders and the public understand the resources like this that are now available. Thank you so much. Take it away, Sarah. All right. So as Mike said, we have a uh, a little bit of a presentation for you. We've tried to incorporate answers to some of the questions that we've heard since we've gone live a few weeks ago. Um, and then Anne's gonna demo the site for you. And then um, we definitely wanna hear your questions for us. We are here this morning to talk about the new access application from the Minnesota Judicial Branch called Minnesota Court Records Online, also known as MCRO. The Judicial Branch is transforming how it provides remote or online access to appropriate public cases and documents in our state district courts. MCRO is going to be the application that will allow our users to search, retrieve, and eventually purchase public documents in those public case types without the need to visit a courthouse. Why is this project, along with online access, important to the judicial branch? And I think more importantly, why is it important to you as lawyers? So first of all, online access is required by our rules of public access. Rule 8, subdivision 2 says that we need to be sharing certain public cases and now public documents online with you. We also are doing this to increase access to appropriate public court documents and cases. We want to enhance transparency to our judicial proceedings and to meet a greater demand for online services, including the ability to view these documents online without needing to come to a courthouse. So in 2021, I think we're all familiar with doing business online. Haven't done some online shopping yet today, but it, it will happen by the end of the day. Um, the judicial branch knows that not everyone can easily make it to a courthouse, and especially now with the pandemic. Your clients can't make it to you. You maybe can't make it to the courthouse. People are working in different locations, and not all clients will have a means to access court records. We've also heard from attorneys that the ability to view documents when you're meeting with a client or when you're retained last minute before a court appearance is very important. The branch has two public access applications today, and I assume most of you are, are very familiar with these. So the first is Minnesota Public Access Courthouse. These provide access to all public cases and public documents statewide. The terminals are available in each of our courthouses and at the state law library. So as soon as you're using one of these, you can view cases from public cases from all over the state. We rolled this out probably about seven years ago now. 
The second public access application is Minnesota Public Access Remote. This is our online application that we've had for a very long time. It will provide access to you to those public cases that we can share online and the register of actions. As you all know, there's no document access available. There's not a way for us to add document access to that application. This is an older application. Our vendor told us some time ago that they are not making any updates or big enhancements to it. So this is part of why we started to move into MCRO. But for you today, we want you to know that both of these applications remain available for you to use, even as we move into MCRO. So here's MCRO. As of March 17th, St. Patty's Day, MCRO is live for the general public for all of you as an additional access application available for you to use. It does provide access to the public documents that we're authorized to share with you online. We are, we are continuing to develop this application and we'll talk about that in just a second, what our approach is here. But know that development is continuing to add additional functionality so that MCRO is gonna be more in line with MPA remote, but with a better feel and I think you're gonna find it more user-friendly. So we are working right now to add those registers of actions and the additional search options. This is the application that the branch is using to meet those expectations for online access and to fulfill our court rule requirements. Um, and we're also um, updating this product a lot based on user feedback. So we've heard from the users from the past couple of years about what they expect. We've heard from our pilot users. Landon was one of our pilot users, provided great feedback for us. And we're working hard to incorporate that so that this product works for you. So Mike, here's a little bit of that, that project timeline that I, I think you were hinting at. I think one of the most frequent questions we get, and Jody gets this a lot too, is why has this taken so long? What is going on? So we can assure you that the judicial branch has been working on this for some time. In 2015, when um, other court rules were amended to move to mandatory e-filing and e-service statewide, the rules of public access were also updated at the same time. Those rules changed and expanded what on what documents will be available for you online. For example, prior to July 1st, 2015, there were some courts generated documents that could be available, such as orders, notices, judgments, appellate opinions. Well, as of July 1st, 2015, we added in some party submitted documents in certain case types as well to really expand what will be available. In 2016, this project started, July of 2016. Um, once those rules had, had gone into effect, then we formed this project to start expanding online access. In January of 2017, our Judicial Council, which is our decision-making, um, our leadership group at the branch, they decided to pursue this development for this new expanded online access with a vendor. We worked with that vendor in 2017 and 2018. Unfortunately, nothing came to fruition for us to share with you. In 2019, we spent a year looking at other technology options, um, trying to figure out what else we could do with other states. And then last year in March, 2020, Judicial Council made the decision to develop this application internally with our judicial branch staff and resources. So we are using our IT staff, our developers, our business resources, our district court staff, um, our quality assurance people to build this application for you. In January of this year, our phase one pilot began, big step forward. And then on March 17th, we went live for general release for the general public. And we had a quick question regarding the timeline. It looks mm -hmm. like, uh, the driver's MNIT, the driver's license uh, issues and everything like that. I'm wondering, well, the, the question is whether or not there was any connection between the timeline that we're looking at here and MNIT. Uh, Minlars probably. I suspect so, I'm, I'm not yeah. 
clear on the question, but I don't know if there's a big connection. We we are separate from Minlar, so no. I mean, we've we've watched that project. We've looked at their lessons learned. Um, Anne, Anne is very familiar with it. I know she's talked to people about it, but we are we are a separate project from that. So if our timelines inter overlap, it would just be a coincidence. And our internal staff are not minute staff. All right, let's talk a little bit about this phased in development approach that I mentioned. When Judicial Council approved this project for internal development in March of 2020, they approved a phased in development approach. And the idea behind this approach would that, was that this would allow us to meet the request to meet the demand for online access to documents while we continue to develop some of the other functionality. So we're gonna show you that we have three phases for the development, three phases for the project. Each one is gonna increase the functionality you have in MCRO and build on what we've already done. The, the approach will allow us to get pieces of development to you right as they're finished. So we had the option of doing all of the development and then releasing it to you as one big package at the end, or it was very important to judicial counsel to at least get you the documents. So that's why phase one is the documents, and then we'll show you what we're gonna keep adding on so that you can benefit from this as we've done the development. Eventually, the existing MPA remote application will go away, but that will be a decision once MCRO is fully developed and implemented, and we make sure that you have everything you need for public access in this application. That might be a good time to interject with John's question, uh, which I, I was expecting someone to ask, uh, are there beta testing opportunities for these future upgrades? <laughs> and you wanna chat about that? Uh, so we are planning to have pilots for each of the phases. Our steering committee is the one who recommends who, who those pilots are. So while we will have those, I'm not sure exactly who the um, participants will be. I think we might ask some of our pilots to return, Landon. <laughs> <laughs> I would not say no. It, uh, I, will, I will just chime in very quickly and say that this, this program and the work that you guys have done has absolutely changed my practice for the better. Um, so I was very happy to be a participant. But our steering committee will make that final decision. There's a question in the chat um, saying we could see documents at courthouse on MPA. Why couldn't we just take that remote to everybody? Very good question. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, the application that we use at the courthouses is the same application that we use to provide online access. So again, the we tried to work with the vendor to expand the online part of that. And that's when they told us that they're not making any changes to that. So it really wasn't an option for us to build on to either one of those existing applications. We, and the second reason is we also need to be careful because the access provided at the courthouse is not the same as the access provided online. So we have to make sure that we keep what you can see in each location separate. It, and just to that quickly, um, I suspect the differences uh, tend to be rule-based. Um, so there, there's probably some more work that the Rules of Public Access Committee needs right. to do to mesh that up and make that equal. Right. Yep, and, and we'll go into it in a little bit, but it, I think that one of the interesting things that I'm waiting for is, you know, we, we've had these rules for some time. Now that we're able to share these documents, I think we're gonna learn a lot more about what people need and expect. So as we mentioned, our phase one of the project went live on March 17th. Users may now search and access certain public documents, the ones that are available online, when they have a case number. If your case number is unknown, you will need to find it through a different means. You know, similar, I think, to what you need to do for e-filing, right? When you when you need to get something to the court and you don't have the case number. 
Um, again, MPA Remote and MPA Courthouse are still available. So you may need to flip over into MPA Remote if you're working online to see if you can find the case information that way. Um, just remember, and Landon, I think this goes into the rules differences, not everything is going to be available on MPA remote, right? We, we have that pending name search limitation per the rules. So if you're searching for a criminal case that does not have a conviction, you're not going to be able to search by defendant name. You will need to do that at the courthouse or use another method to find that case number. Um, and then some public cases aren't available online, so you, you won't find them when searching, such as a juvenile protection or an order for protection case. Um, but if the document's not available on MCRO, then continue to request access like you would today. But hopefully, especially with those 2015 and forward documents, you'll be able to find a lot of what you need. And I did notice, um, maybe it was just a one-off, but I did notice when I'm searching for things that are older than uh, 2015, they'll occasionally pop up as well. So it's, right. it's they're there if the, my understanding is that they're there if the courthouse has previously scanned them and done that work. Um, across the state of Minnesota, we're, we're back up to at least 2015. Some counties and districts are further back than that, correct? Yep, Landon, that was a great way to say it. Yep, we, we always say, you know, if you're looking for something 2015, get in there, try it, definitely try it. But yes, our courts didn't start scanning statewide until 2013, 2014-ish, you know, and then um, again, the rules were different. So even if you do have a document pre-2015, those party submitted documents won't be available because we didn't have authority until July 1st, 2015. Phase two, uh, for phase two, you'll be able to access a new register of actions. This is quickly becoming one of my favorite parts of the application. I think it looks great. I think it's very user friendly. Um, and you'll also be able to access additional search features. So the register of actions is, is the, my husband calls it the, the case docket. So this is where you see all your case information, the case events, hearings, the document index numbers that we heard from in our pilots will be there. And then you'll also see document icons. We're expanding the search options so that you can also search by person name, business name, attorney name, citation number, case number, and bar number. Then in phase three, oh, and our date for our target date right now for phase two is later in 2021. For phase three, which we're shooting for in 2022, users will be able to search for calendars and, and judgments. These are the cal court calendar and the judgment search options in um, MPA remote today. And then we will also implement the access fee. And I, I did see the question pop up. A document icon is when you're looking at the register of actions, let's see, you'll, you'll see an event. So you'll see order for dismissal from the court. If there's a document that goes along with that, that you can view online, there will be a button to click on right next to that event. And I, I suspect uh, in regards to the access fee being implemented, you guys are probably tracking the uh, lawsuit I believe that there's a lawsuit regarding uh, the federal PACER system and their paywall. So um, however that ends up going will probably impact whatever the access fee is here. Um, I don't know, has that been talked about? Because I know as soon as uh, I was allowed to provide this information to, to some groups, the immediate response was, oh, look, they're going to do a paywall. They just want our money. <laughs> they skipped over all the good. Uh, it went straight to the, they want money. Um, my question is, to alleviate some of the concerns, I'm assuming there's a lot of different discussion about how are we going to do this? Are we going to do it per document? Are we going to do subscription? Are we going to do things like that? I, I'm hoping that that conversation is being had. <laughs> Multiple conversations. And do you want to click to the next slide? I was going to say, Kurt, Kurt Anderson also I had a question earlier, you know, whether you considered adopting the PACER system for the state courts. And I know that one of the big complaints about PACER is oftentimes you'll incur the fees before you know what the fees even are. Right. So we did, we were asked multiple times by judicial counsel if we could just use PACER. We cannot. That is the federal system. The feds keep their federal system to themselves. 
um, but but that has come up multiple times over the years. So, and, and a little bit more about the access fee in Landon, hopefully this, this answers some of your questions. So wh why an access fee? Um, another one of our very frequently asked questions. The access fee was decided by Judicial Council in September of 2017. So somewhat early on with this project, I think. The, one of the biggest reasons is that when you, as you know, when you go to a courthouse, if you need a document and you need to take that document with you, you are charged the statutory copy fee. And Judicial Council was very aware that they wanted there to be consistency. They didn't want it to feel like people who have to go to the courthouse were gonna have to pay when somebody who has access to the internet and the means to get to MCRO would not. Um, so the access fee is coming. The decision was also made that since we're rolling out our development and developing it in phases, this access fee is going to be the last layer, if you will, that we're going to add on to it. So the, it's not going to be implemented until we know that the system is, is complete and available for you. Judicial Council made the decision that the MCRO access fee will be the same rate as what's provided for in statute, so currently $8.00. Something could change between now and then, but $8 is the number that we have in mind. Um, so one of your points, Landon, once charged, this fee will not go to the judicial branch. This will go to the state general fund, just like the statutory copy fee does. The first page of every document will continue to be available as a preview. So hopefully this will help some of the concerns about PACER where you don't know what you're buying. Um, so you will always see that first page. And then if you want more, then you can click into it and, and purchase that. If the document is only one page and we watch this closely, we have a, um, a high percentage of documents that are only one page, it will continue to be available at no charge. Um, just an, another note too is MCRO is not a replacement for anything that parties and council are serving each other that will continue per court rules. Anything the court is required to send you, I know attorneys lots of times these days it's via email, will continue to be sent. Um, and then the, the copy fee at the MPA courthouse terminals in the state law library remains in effect. Lots of questions yeah. in the chat. About I these. see my chat <laughs> popping up like crazy. We, we, you know, like I said, we mentioned the fees and now everything's blowing up. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, ask one of them that kind of popped up fairly early on. Um, will you be able to obtain and purchase certified copies? Because I think uh, if I recall correctly, the $8 fee was the certified copy fee. Um, is that intended to be a certified copy when you purchase it that way? No, no, the $8 fee is a plain copy fee. Um, the certified copy fee is, oh, and is it four, 12 or 14? I always get them confused since we lost the technology fee. Um, this is not a certified copy. This is a considered a plain copy. If you need a certified copy with that um, court administrator's stamp and signature on it, you'll still need to get that from court admin. And then, of course, the other question that keeps popping up everywhere is, uh, if private attorneys are going to be charged this fee for making the documents, are the um, public entities, such as the county attorneys, also going to be charged $8 per copy? That hasn't been discussed. Um, you know, those are separate discussions. They get a lot of copies at no charge for most of their cases, as is. So we, for this project and the access fee, we are just focused on MCRO. Okay. I think we got uh, the majority of those questions. I, I suspect I'll just kind of head off those questions if I may. Um, I, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of discussion behind that and probably uh, opening that up for public input. Is, is that the plan? I know a lot of times before the court issues an order, there's a, uh, mm -hmm. a, and I can't think of the word right now, uh, public input time period. Comment period. Comment period, thank you. <laughs> But you that, know, I, I several steps down the road. I don't know. Um, I we do know that this there's going to be a lot of questions and a lot of discussions. That's why we're so grateful to have Jody working with us on this project right from the start. Um, 
you know, Landon, I think the, the first thing was to really get phase one done and out the door. And now we'll start to have more of those conversations about what's coming. Thank you. Okay, we do get a lot of questions about what documents are available. We've touched on some of it already, but we did wanna make sure that we have this here for you. So again, July 1st, 2015 is that important date in terms of online access to district court records. Again, that's when those rules of public access took effect. They coincide again too with the, the date for moving to mandatory e-filing and e-service statewide. What is available in MCRO? So um, one note before we go through these bullets, it includes the registers of actions, but as we mentioned, those will come later this year. So right now you have the documents available on this slide. And that includes all public documents filed on or after July 1st, 2015 in public criminal, public civil, and public probate, guardianship, conservator, and trust cases. That includes court generated and party submitted documents that are public. So you will also have registers of actions and now you have public court generated documents filed on or after July 1st, 2015 in public family cases, including paternity cases that are public as of January 1st, 2021 and some older paternity cases when there's post adjudication action. When we add the registers of actions, you will have access to a register of action in the civil commitment cases, no document access in those cases per the rules of public access. Um, and then as, as Landon said very well earlier, documents filed prior to July 1st, 2015 are limited based on the rules in effect and when courts were scanning. So go ahead and jump in there and try to get them. But if not, you may need to request access like you do today or like you have been doing. One question that keeps popping up so I, because it's popping up from different people. Uh, access to these documents, uh, is it different for attorneys, private attorneys, public uh, attorneys versus the general public. My understanding is this is statewide for everybody. Is that correct? Right. Yep, that's a great question. So this access application, the audience is the general public. The general public, I love this when I see this definition, the general public includes everybody. So it includes private attorneys, it includes media, it includes litigants, landlords, bail agencies. In Minnesota, we don't have separate access for private attorneys. You get what the general public gets. So um, the limits on what you can get online, what you've probably learned already with MPA remote, those will continue in MCRO. Again, rules of public access. We should have, maybe Landon, we should have started a tally for how many times we, we say that in this presentation. Um, if you need to review a public case or document not in MCRO, you will need to use, continue to use the MPA courthouse terminals. What are these cases? Because we do get questions on these. Um, the, the first two have come up a lot with our pilot. Order for protection and harassment restraining order cases will need to be viewed at a courthouse. There's no remote access to them. There's also no remote online access when we have an out of state, no contact order case. Our felony level juvenile delinquency for juveniles at least 16 years old cases, D16s, not available online, but you can get them at the courthouse. Same with child protection cases, same with civil commitment cases, and search warrants are also not available in MCRO. We had a couple of questions about that during our pilot. So I can say though that there is an effort at state court administration to try to make those search warrants available. It won't happen overnight, it won't happen next month, but, but we're, we're seeing what we could possibly make available. You know, if, uh, and I think this is probably a public access rules issue uh, regarding the family law cases and the family law documents. Um, run, running through that, uh, there's no access to motion documents. Correct. Is that a plan change or is that something that the rules committee needs to address? That would be a rules change. That was actually our very first question in the pilot within probably a half an hour of opening this up for our pilot participants. We had a family law attorney looking for a motion. 
I, I believe I, I was there for that question as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no public access. Um, obviously, no public access is going to continue for confidential cases uh, and confidential documents, non public. Um, what are these? These are our domestic abuse and harassment restraining order cases before a respondent is served, juvenile delinquency cases, paternity cases filed pre January 1st without any post adjudication activity adoption cases, confidential name cases, cases and documents made non-public pursuant to, to judicial order, and then non-public documents. I think you most, you know, are very familiar with them. I think reports, evaluations, confidential fi financial source documents, and so on. And just to clear up the, the question that I'm sure some criminal defense attorneys are thinking out there is the very first one on there for domestic abuse cases, this is in regards to orders for protection, not in regards to domestic abuse, criminal charges. So the criminal absolutely. charges are not included in that first line. Yep, absolutely. All right, now I'm gonna be quiet. Anne's gonna take it over for a demo. And hopefully I am going to do this so that we share correctly. Okay. Maybe we'll that, it up that demo is, go ahead, Mike. Say you want to grab some of the additional questions while we're loading it up, Landon? Yeah. Uh, while we're loading it up, one of the questions came up, which is, is there any long-term project to look back further? So I know that we've scanned everything starting at 13, 14, solidly in 15, but my understanding is we're going to continue to go backwards when we can. Is that correct? I don't think that's correct. Okay. So a, a lot of our courts are back, you know, we call it back scanning a lot of their files so that there is an electronic, a digital copy rather than having the enormous file rooms or, and of course, then, you know, what happens with files falling apart after so long, or sometimes we've had some weather issues with them. Even if a court back scans, that doesn't mean it's going to be available because if it's a document from, let's say, 2010, they need to contact the legal counsel division to try to figure out how that could be classified. And even if it's public, it may not be available online. So they don't quite go together. I think that as people start using MCRO, if there are some documents that could be classified so that they could be available, we may see that, but I haven't heard of a big effort to really make that happen. And of course, one of the reasons that uh, we've kind of brought up that a lot of attorneys are looking for this, at least on the criminal side, is for expungement purposes. Um, so thankfully, most of my searches, I've found the same thing through this site as I've been able to get when going to the courthouse. So that's been nice. Okay. Other... Oh. Sorry, go ahead. One of the other questions, which might be something we, we'd get into a little bit more with the demo is, as a private attorney, how can I get access to the files when representing a foster parent in a case? So it sounds like those would be restricted files if I'm understanding correctly, and that would probably be limited to the courthouse, is that correct? Right, so depending on what the what the case is, if it's a, a, a child protection case, it should be public. So you should be able to go to the courthouse and view it and then request copies of anything you need. I think some of those older cases may have been confidential. So you're probably gonna have to call court administration and see what they recommend. Are we caught up on questions? I don't know that we ever will be, just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You should be seeing them in courts.gov site. Is that uh, what everybody's seeing? Looks yep. great. Okay, so the way that you will get to MCRO is through the maincourts.gov site off of our access case records page. You'll go to the Minnesota trial courts page. You'll see that we still have our MPA remote, our current version still available. So if you need to look up to get that case number, you absolutely can. And then you would just click on this uh, Minnesota court records online button and it would bring you to our uh, MCRO site. I am going to go into a test environment. So the 
this is our test environment. The first thing that you will see is our um, terms and conditions. It's easy enough to accept. You, oh, you may or may not get a recaptcha, you know, those wonderful little puzzle pieces. Um, in this instance, I did not get that recaptcha. Um, it was merciful to me this morning because it usually hates me and makes me go through several versions of it. It's it, it always Google... asked me to find uh, stoplights, and apparently yeah. I am really bad at seeing stoplights. I, 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 can't, I, I can't recognize bicycles for some reason. I don't, I don't <laughs> and the clue on the stoplight says it includes that little teeny tiny piece that's in the next square. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it's a Google algorithm, so we have no control over when those recaptchas do or do not appear. So um, today was a good day. That's all I'm going to be able to say. Uh, this is our landing page. It does include things like uh, we have the option to have a site message. We try to put our high messages at the very top so that if, um, for example, for some reason the system is down, we put it at the top, so it's like, okay, sorry, it's down. Don't bother looking any further. I'm sorry, it just isn't working at the moment. Anything like that. Uh, we do have then a welcome message, which includes a lot of information uh, that you may find helpful. We also have some helpful links on the side. These take you directly to things like our branch website, um, our contact form, should you need assistance in any way, uh, the rules of access, those kind of things. So those are just kind of helpful links. Then we also have a spot for some less important site messages. So if we have standard downtime, um, you know, we have site maintenance every Sunday pretty much. Uh, we just include that there so that if you are having issues, you can look at that and realize that that might be why maybe it's a little slower or something like that. Generally speaking, um, we aren't down for very long. Uh, so if you are on, on a Sunday and you have a problem, just please try again in a little bit. The um, part that everybody really cares about is up here. It is our document search. Oh, and one thing we are very proud of is we are digitally accessible. So you can tab through and screen readers also work very well with our system. So when you tab on that document search, you just have to put in the case number that you are looking for. And these are not real case numbers. So they're a little longer than what you probably have seen. After you have put in the case number, you simply click on find documents. Ah, and here's where I, I have my love-hate relationship with reCAPTCHA. Ah, and it only made me go through one and it was a crosswalk. I can do those. Um, once you get to that screen, we include case details. This is mostly so that you can verify that this is the case that you wanted, that you didn't you know, fat finger it and put in too many ones or not enough eights or something like that. It will include the case title, so that um, should also help you make sure that you are on the case that you plan to be on. We do have a print button. Up here, uh, this will allow you to print a list of the documents. It does not allow you to um, automatically select all documents in print. That is uh, not anything that we offer at this time. But if I were looking to see if I had all the documents, I might print this list and then sort of check them off as I get them. Um, is there any that helps. plan to do a kind of uh, download all option? I, I'd much rather pay $8 for the download all than $8 for the individual documents. <laughs> that is not uh, in scope of this project at this point. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> then once you do get to the uh, list of documents that are available online, uh, it uh, gives the date and the event name, if you will. This is where we know that a lot of the events are named the same. So that's why that one page preview will likely be helpful so that you can look in and uh, make sure that the document, the other document that you're looking for is the other document you really want. Uh, there is also a number of pages that are within the document that's included right over here. Uh, that could also help you know if that's the document that you want. It also might help you know if you were had to pay for the document or not once we get to that stage. Uh, when we had that what is an icon question earlier, this 
is the icon. So this same type of icon will be on the events listing on the ROA once we could develop that as well. So in order to access any of these actual documents, you simply click on the view document. Keeping in mind that we're in a test system, it takes just a little bit longer. Um, it's really amazingly fast in production, if you ask me. Uh, once you, it's available, uh, depending on your browser settings and how you have your computer set up, it'll either be at the bottom here or it could be in a folder, entirely um, dependent upon how you have your computer set up. We did, um, one of the pilot changes we made, thanks to uh, Landon and the other people on the pilot, is we made sure that the name of this document is a little bit more comprehensive than it was originally. So it gives the case number, it gives the event name, it gives everything else, because you can have multiple of these open and it can be hard otherwise if you didn't have that information to know if you're going back to them, which one you actually want to go to. So then once you've decided that's what you want, you just go in and you can, um, it just basically opens the document as it is. Again, this is a test document, not real. So um, it, it would actually show whatever is in Mensa's uh, is what would show on here. So a, a couple questions that I, I think I've seen in regards to the test document. I think we can still use the test document for these. Um, of course, looking at the test document, you wouldn't be able to do any editing or modification because of the way that this document is saved and, and created, correct? So you can't go in there and, and highlight and change words and, and edit the PDF. No, that probably, that is probably for a very specific reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed, we do want to keep our documents uh, secure and in their original version. And apologies if I've, I've missed it, but I think there were several questions about the watermark as well or the yep. shadow as some people. The watermark is here. Um, I hadn't gotten there, but yes, there is a watermark that appears on it. It's very faint in this, uh, the way my screen is appearing, but it is uh, the judicial logo and it says Minnesota Judicial Branch. We keep it light enough that uh, it doesn't interfere with the font on the actual document that you're reading, but there is indeed a watermark on each. Um, there are times when the watermark might be kind of the other direction. Again, that's um, uh, kind of a setting on your computer sometimes, um, but there is a logo watermark. Any other questions about the logo? So, well, now, is that, go ahead. To, now, is that to distinguish it from a certified copy? That, and it also adds a layer of protection um, so that people don't change uh, our court documents that have been previously filed. And of course, I believe that if they were scanned OCR, they are available OCR. When we, um, oh, okay, so this is a little bit of a technical explanation. Please uh, have patience with me as I stumble through it. Um, so the documents that are filed through EFS are PDF and are we're supposed to be OCR. There is a process in MINSYS that PDFs and OCRs, um, if there are some other documents, including scanned ones, there are some original documents that are TIFF. So prior to 2015, maybe 2013, some of our documents are TIFF and not yet OCR'd. The process that adds the watermark also turns them into PDFs and makes them OCR. So they should be OCR by the time you receive them. Um, they may have gone through a couple of variations and um, technical work to get it that way. And occasionally there's a, a PDF signature problem that kind of comes up. <clears throat> uh, can you address that at all? <laughs> yep, it's um, it's actually not a signature problem. It, it kind of gives you a warning saying that there may be a problem with the signatures. If you go in and you accept it, our, our logo or our watermark is a digital signature. So if there was a previous signature on there, our digital signature adds a layer and all you have to do is accept that. Um, so it's like, again, it's sort of a setting that you've got. Once you accept and say that they're valid, then um, that kind of goes away on that document. But it, it, it may um, appear in other documents as well. You just have to accept them. 
And after the demo, Anne's going to show you um, our website and where we have some support resources. And we do have some steps about that in one of our FAQs. You can also feel free to, to contact us and we can help you work through that if you're seeing it. Anything else? And there's uh, still a lot of questions regarding the cost. And I want to uh, reiterate that, of course, there is no cost at this stage. Everybody okay. jump in there, feel free, um, play with it, don't break it. Uh, <laughs> I love this program, don't break it, uh, but play with it, uh, find the, the places that are working and not working. Obviously, if they find a bug, what should they do? There is a contact form and please do contact us. Um, we have, uh, like knock on wood, we've had amazing luck and success with it so far, but we do want to know if there is a problem. So yes, please do use that contact form to contact us. I am going to go over quick and show you a search for a family case. So you can either clear it or you can just overwrite that. The family case that we have set up for you today is And then again, just find the documents. Oh, Landon, here's our traffic light. See how that little tiny piece is there? Yep, it, it, it always gets me. Yep, me too, usually. And then crosswalks. Oh, see. Maybe, maybe that's what we need the program on is how to handle these, <laughs> <laughs> these identification procedures. <laughs> And they're just as, like I said, Google decides whether or not it likes me or hates me. They, they really like you today. Uh, no, it didn't. <laughs> I missed a piece of a crosswalk. Uh, yep, I, I saw that one last piece. Uh, Every, everybody is just, uh, you know, observing you go through this. Now. I know. It's so much fun, isn't it, to watch? You should try yeah, doing it I, in front of, like, judicial counsel. That's just um, a ton of fun. I, I would encourage everybody that is asking about the fees and concerned about the fees and the $8, because I know I, I said $8 because that's what I'm used to at the courts. Um, prepare your legal arguments. This will be open for public <laughs> comment when the aspect of court fees and finances and everything goes live. Uh, at the end of the third phase, am I saying that correctly? Uh, we are now uh, finishing phase one uh, we have two more phases to go. The everything is going to be free. Um, you know, we get we get the freebies until the end, and everybody can prepare their legal arguments for why there should not be cost, or attorneys should get an exemption, or whatever argument you want to make. But that's not something. My understanding that we have any control over, or really any information on at this stage. Right. And, Sorry and to kind of cut that conversation. Up. Well, I, but I, this is I, I'm, I'm seeing some of the, the comments and the concern, I think. I mean, we we know we know this and this was exactly the discussion that Judicial Council had. So I think this is this is good information for us to take back to them. Um, but you, you're absolutely right, Landon. I mean, we're we're not going to charge any sort of fee until this is completely developed and implemented, which would be in 2022. The idea right now is that if you need a document online, there would be a fee once it's charged in 2022, because that's what happens when you come to the courthouse. So they were trying to keep that, the user experience consistent for that. The $8 fee is the, sta it, it's the statutory fee. That wasn't just something that judicial council made up. We're, we're following the direction in the statute. So um, there, there will be more to come. Yes. So so and I also saw a question about North Dakota. The, the easiest answer is that we're different than North Dakota, right? I mean, we, we our state we system better, is, is completely different. They're actually continuing to use a Tyler product. So we've moved away from that now with MCROW. They handle their access, what's available, how they charge completely differently than we do. And of course, uh, in addition to preparing your legal arguments for why that why this shouldn't have the fee, uh, call your legislators. Don't harass the courts. <laughs> call your legislators and tell them to correct that law. We have time now. Actually, th this is probably the opportunity to do it. You know, for anybody that's connected or anybody that wants to raise their voice and and let the elected officials know, 
maybe we should try to adjust that statute before 2022 when this goes live and the court might be bound by the statute. Or through the one of the sections at the MSBA, there's a whole process by which, and I always get this wrong, Sherry Knuth, my colleague, is a legislative person at the Bar Association, but the sections have a process by which you can um, advance legislation as well. So this is a family case, same thing, just click on the document. Sarah, did you wanna talk about what was available? Um, because again, this is family, so it is those. Right, so we wanted to show you this, the family case because you can see right away um, with the list of documents available, how much more limited it is. So again, these are only the court generated documents. So you're gonna see the orders, the notices, what the court signs or sends. Any other questions about the demo? Lots of questions. Uh, in regards to the, the watermark, I think the watermark is one of the things that gives a lot of people problems. And one of the things that I've experienced as well is, you know, you, you get a download of a complaint and you need to cite that complaint and, uh, you know, talk about specific language in the complaint or a judge's order in the motion that you're making. Because of the watermark, of course, we can't copy and paste. <laughs> um, I think that a lot of people, it sounds like, may have found workarounds, whether that's printing it and scanning it again or things like that. But there's no option through the, the uh, access that we have available to get a copy without the watermark or to simply highlight certain se sections of text, correct? That is correct. In our, in our tool, uh, you cannot do that. But as you said there. No doubt. Other, our other, other people may have found workarounds that um, may need to be corrected if they get brought to the attention of the wrong person. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> I'm, I will say that I'm still looking for my own personal workaround, but uh, so far my workaround has been to retype whatever is in the document. <laughs> um, let's see. I, I promised uh, before I forget, I want to make sure I ask about MGA government access. Uh, is that also being replaced? Uh, there were a couple of questions here, and I apologize. I don't think we addressed that one. No, it's not. So MGA received an update in November, Anne, is that right? Um, they um, th That is a Tyler product. Um, I, I haven't heard of any other work being done with MGA now. And for those that are asking about the uh, the changes to the public access, specifically, I see some family law questions popping up. Obviously, that's something that we we mentioned earlier that would have to be addressed by the public access committee. My latest response: uh, I do serve on the public access committee, at least as far as I know. They haven't kicked me off yet. Um, but <laughs> regarding the public access committee, I've been told that all of the Court committees are currently suspended during the pandemic. They are not meeting. Um, I believe the public access committee had one last meeting back in November before that happened. I don't believe that there is any planned meeting at this time, but that is something that uh, you know people can send their input along to the public access committee when it does meet. There, there are, and I will assure everybody, there are family law attorneys, there are uh, criminal defense attorneys, public attorneys, uh, Non-attorneys, we, we try to get people from every area and walk of life uh, when having these discussions. And the discussions regarding what should be public and not public is <clears throat> very robust. Um, a lot of positions on, on all sides for it seems like every aspect of this. But um, if people have concerns or reasons that things should be public, definitely bring that to the public access committee. I have switched back to the PowerPoint again. Are you seeing reference resources? Yes. Yep, we are. Oh, and a quick question, Mike, for uh, the CLE number, sorry. Ah, uh, yes, sorry, multitasking here. Uh, the number uh, for today's presentation is 353-203-2000. 
I'll drop that into the chat as well. The CLE code, the number. The CLE code is 353203. We're just logging back into um, uh, MCrow. I have to, uh, I've been calling it something else for some reason. I, just, <laughs> right. I you know, I, I start with uh, uh, MCRO and I'm not sure I'll ever be able to switch to MCrow. Um, <laughs> it sounds too much like a, sports mascot to me <laughs> go m <-Crow. laughs> but well, because uh, we went because we went on st patrick's day somebody wanted to call it nick grow <laughs> yeah i, I missed that. an opportunity on that one <laughs> i'm a, i'm a fan of the uh, sci-fi uh show uh the expanse which has got the martian congressional republic and then whatever follows that so i, I keep going back to my <laughs> Weird. And a, a quick response. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Dan Adkins for not being able to figure out how to post to all attendees as well. So all his uh, snarky comments are only sent to me. Thank you. <laughs> there, there are several. Uh, the reason I was logging in here quickly again, just to say, there were several questions about uh, viewing versus printing. It's essentially mm -hmm. the same thing, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. Once you see it and download it, it is yours. You can print it. Yeah. Um, and even just to, to reopen that can, can of worms, uh, what you guys have talked about is the first page, you're going to be able to see the first page no matter what. Uh, there's no, not going to be any cost for the first page. And I will say, at least on the criminal side of things, the most, most of what we see nowadays is uh, pandemic rescheduling notices, which are one page anyway. <laughs> but um, a lot of that data and a lot of the information to determine whether or not you want it is going to be you know, something you get from that first page. So. Correct. <clears throat> and uh, I know that we've talked about the fact that uh, court access, public access is everybody access. There is, uh, there's a fair, fair number of questions asking if there's any intent to, um, one, make it more available for uh, the attorney of record or private attorneys or uh, anything to that extent. Is there anything in the works that, uh, give a different level of access to somebody that has a Minnesota bar number versus somebody that doesn't. No, and not because we don't hear you, be, because we do, um, and we get this question a lot, but because our rules of public access don't tell us to provide that type of access. We are rule bound. Um, and regarding the presentation, is that something that's also available? Is that presentation available online? Well, we, um, it's not online, but we were planning to send you guys a copy of it. So we Great, figured people. Uh, yeah, folks, I will, uh, we've got the session recorded. It'll be in the Practice Law Library and on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to the Practice Law Library, um, I'll provide, if it's all right with everyone, your contact information. Um, the materials uh, that you've been viewing today, um, maybe links to the other resources that you uh, that are on that page also, uh, and the video, of course, as well. So you can watch the, the program again, if you wish. And our contact information is on the last slide, so yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any last burning questions? Uh, uh, the chat and the Q&A is um, lively. So um, Landon, have I missed uh, a key one here before we wrap? Um, one that actually hasn't been asked, but I know would be asked by our former guests. Uh, so I'll figure I'll throw this out there. We've had guests on here that of course go through and they collect data and they collect all the documents they can to scan it and try to uh, help people research and find things in the future. Um, I, I'm trying to think the best term for them, but document gatherers, mass downloaders, whatever you want to call them. Um, is there any plan or set up in regards to that? I know that we have systems set up for public, through the public access where they can get copies of the registers of action and case history, but not necessarily the documents. Is that being contemplated? Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that question quickly too. I think developer type access, if like Pacer, for example, has got a lot of, uh, you know, in part because Pacer hasn't been a great system, they've built services over Pacer, like Pacer Pro, for example. And I know the uh, the MSBA's uh, tech section has wanted 
access to the data to measure things like, um, you know, to the extent you can, uh, you know, bias and what happens in rural communities versus urban communities, um, you know, that kind of thing. I am eager to start scraping documents for uh, a, uh, you know, a, a briefs library and practice law, um, you know, things like that. Uh, so uh, I'll tack that coda on to Landon's question. Sarah, you get to answer that one. Uh, yeah, sorry, I couldn't find my unmute, I promise. I was just looking for the unmute. Um, that is not planned as part of this project. So I, th I think when you start talking about scraping, first it scares people at the branch, yeah. um, but then some of the other data behind it and being able to report, that moves more towards um, a bulk data request. So that would be handled through that process and working with the branch in that way, rather than through the actual MCRO application. And I will say, uh, just to back, you know, go against my own point, I think one of the issues for the bulk data collection on just case records, not even talking about the individual documents, was a concern, especially for expungements, whether it's uh, um, eviction expungements or criminal expungements, is how do we track those if people are, are scraping all this data? How do we ensure that they are not providing information that is no longer active, pub publicly accessible? Right. How do they get the updates? Right. So if you get a <laughs> if you get a, a bunch of data today and then it's out of date in two weeks because these cases keep going on, right? How do you get that so that they have the right information? And, you know, that was a big rules committee discussion for you guys a couple of years ago. That was huge, and uh, we put a lot of restrictions on that, and I think. Uh, we needed a lot of assurances that that was going to be kept safe for people so that they weren't going to live with these even if the court said it's expunged. Right. Um, <clears throat> one of the things on here, of course, is, uh, oh, I thought I just saw the question. I'm just trying to skim through and make sure we've <coughs> you have lost the question I had. <laughs> All right, and I, 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 I'd be happy to chat all day long. Uh, I, I do need to, to wrap us up. Uh, Thank you folks for, for joining us, uh, Sarah, Jody, Ann, a, a great presentation. Thank you so much for providing this information. Clearly a lot of interest, a lot of questions. Uh, and again, uh, I'll upload the presentation, the chat transcript, uh, the other uh, contact information onto the Practice Law Library this afternoon. Um, uh, we are um, uh, online next week. So uh, two weeks from now, sorry, two weeks from now, our next uh, program will be uh, uh, pro bono in Minnesota and uh, the State Bar Association and the uh, again the judicial branch website um, uh, on Step Up Minnesota. We'll be chatting with Sherry Knuth and her team. Uh, hope to see you then. Uh, thanks to Taft again, uh, our sponsor, uh, and we hope to see you uh, again soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>